a yo from the kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to the official podcast of the free state of Lieber, where there's a lot of D.O.R. in the sky today. If you just adjusted your personal disposition, you could watch the weather change almost immediately. I'm your host, Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for hanging. Been a minute. Been a minute indeed. But more on that later, because in this episode, I am chatting with Sharon Dockna and Gabriel Lazar, a pair of prolific Organite gifters out on the west coast of the U.S. They run a website called thekembo.com and a YouTube channel called The Human Frequency, which I think was also the name of a syndicated radio show they hosted. Don't quote me on that. I don't know why I think that. But either way... They're in the house. Sharon has a book out called Invisible Soldiers Silent War, and it forms the basis of the first hour of our chat here today. The second hour goes in a completely different direction. But in the first hour here, we're talking not just Organite, but also a bit about the work of Dr. Wilhelm Reich, Organomy, Orgon Energy, Deadly Orgon Radiation, how this all plays a role in the war on consciousness and the virus hysteria of the last couple years. And if you're a fan of smartphones, turn this off right now, because I can tell you, Sharon and Gabe are not. What they are, though, are the sole proprietors of their own names and the only married couple I know enlisted in the core of Cosmic Engineers, where they're fighting the good fight against the Energy Alphas, and where they've accumulated more tower-busting victories than I've accumulated orgasms. Although the tallies are really, really close. Enjoy. Sharon Dofna. Hello. Gabriel Lazar. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to the Kingdom of Ohio in a little place I call Lieber. Thanks for stopping through my neck of the woods. Well, thanks for having us on. No problem. No problem. I'm actually really excited to talk to you guys today. So it's not every day that I come across a married couple fighting the good fight in the way that you guys do. In fact, Don and Carol Croft are the only couple I know of who've done this work. And I guess to that point, you guys are prolific Organite gifters. You catalog your work at thekembo.com and on your YouTube channel called The Human Frequency. And Sharon, you have a book out called Invisible Soldiers Silent War which I will quote from extensively here. And the crux of Great, your work... thanks. <laughs> for sure. And the crux of your work is best summed up by the idea that there is a war on humanity. And there are so many other ways to talk about that, uh, so many facets to it, weather war, frequency war, uh, energetic war, etheric war. You can throw mind control in here too. But I think the best way to describe it is it's actually also a war on consciousness. Yes. And Sharon, in your book, you actually wrote that Quote, the parasites use any means necessary to instill negative thoughts in humans in order to suppress our mind's abilities to create a beautiful world through manifesting positive thoughts into reality. And before working with Orgone Energy, I, you, could not have understood that this war going on in the sky was a reflection of the war on consciousness on Earth. End quote. So let's unpack that. Tell us what you mean when you say the war in the sky is a reflection of the war on consciousness? Well, I have noticed over years of observing the sky and doing this work to clean the sky that whatever is going on on Earth, like if you look into the current events, you'll see that the atmospheric conditions are a direct reflection of current events. And uh, you'll notice, for example, I lately I've seen articles uh, from India and Pakistan, places like that, and I've noticed heavy, heavy DOR in those places, meaning DOR is deadly radiation, and it manifests in the sky through a haze. People refer to it as a chemtrail haze. But this haze in the sky is actually a reflection of oppression of us and our consciousness. And I've noticed throughout the world that you'll see DOR conditions in the skies accompanying oppressive situations against humans. And these days, because we've done so much organite gifting everywhere, I see actually high OR skies, meaning healthy, clean skies, even with the oppression. So I'm noticing that despite all this oppression against humanity, we have overcome to a degree because we're seeing these healthier atmospheric conditions. Even right now, war has broken out in the Ukraine and the sky here is pristine. But normally when these kinds of events are happening, no matter where in the world, the skies everywhere will reflect that. They'll be very hazy. You'll see lots of chemtrails and polluted skies. Lingering pollution. Right. Anyway, what I've noticed is that when people are oppressed, you will see skies that reflect that oppression. However, what I'm seeing now is even with all this attempt to keep oppressing humanity, the skies have cleared up a lot. So I do think we are ascending past that 
uh, through Organite Gifting. Well, do you guys still think that these wars are ongoing then? Because there's still, I mean, a lot of geoengineering happening. In, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I just, Go ahead. I actually want to take a moment to just sort of define three acronyms that we use pretty much constantly, and we'll be using them throughout the show. Sharon mentioned two of them. DOR, that's a Wilhelm Reich term for deadly radiation. And OR, which is the opposite, is that was his term for his abbreviation for orgone energy. So we'll be using DOR and OR, like I said many times throughout the show. And also a third, which is a type of DOR, EMF, which stands for electromagnetic fields. I just want to kind of lay lay that foundation just right here off the bat because we use these terms many times to describe our work and the things that we've learned. But yes, to answer your question, it it absolutely is is an ongoing war and manifesting in many different ways. Obviously, the interesting thing about Sharon's book is that it was written pre-COVID and came out literally three weeks before the lockdowns began. So every, everything that the book talks about is, I, I almost like, I, I think later, later that, that year, I, I kind of thought about it and Wow, this this book is like pure because <laughs> it, it does. It's not tainted by this by this uh, this yeah. virus hysteria, this nonsense. So in a way, I, I thought that was pretty good timing. It's very curious timing, and it's almost like you had some sort of premonition that this book needed to be written and then published prior to 2020. And- it had to be, and I wanted it out even sooner, but I was unable to finish it sooner because the work was continuing, and in fact. The uh, the last entries in the book, the last journal entries that it draws from, are from late 2019. So the work was from 2014 through 2019. So all the way up to COVID. Yeah. And so you mentioned uh, orgonomy there. And I think that's another aspect to this war, is this war on orgonomy, this war on orgone energy, the suppression of, of Reich and his work. In fact, there's a very bold and provocative statement that you make in your book. I think it's literally the first sentence. You say, orgonomy is the science of God. Yep, <laughs> and you also you also quote Ken Rolla, whose work I also admire, and Ken has described Orgon as universal God consciousness. That's yes, correct. And that is a correct description. But th- let me point out that Wilhelm Reich was just the first to scientifically discover Orgon energy. The ancient cultures have known about this for thousands and thousands of years. The attack against the life force energy is nothing new. Don't 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 get me wrong. This is this has been going on since time immemorial. But in the in the past, since Reich discovered organ energy in the 30s, culminating with his work in the, in the 50s with the Cloudbuster and the Organ Accumulator, and ultimately his discovery of these parasitic off-world entities, basically sucking off the life force of the planet for at least twenty-five thousand years. That was his estimate. That was only seventy, about seventy years ago now. So this has been going on in, in varying, varying methods of, of attack and ridicule and suppression. But it's it's nothing. Yeah. Well, I want to assume that there's at least one person in the audience who thinks all this is bullshit. <laughs> and who thinks that Reich's work is nonsense? It can't be proven scientifically. There's nothing to it. But here you are saying it's the science of God, which implies that it, it can be proven and replicated despite the force itself remaining unseen. So how do you support that statement that orgonomy is the science of God? Well, orgonomy is such a, um, it's such a controversial science because it pretty much proves that there's a higher power and an order to the chaos beyond just some random big bang, beyond evolution and all these things that we've been taught. For example, uh, we have been taught that spontaneous generation of life is impossible, yet we know that the Bible says that God created life spontaneously in that way. But how do we prove that what the Bible says is true? Through Wilhelm Reich's bion experiments, he actually witnessed spontaneous generation of life in sterile vacuum tubes in the form of bions, which are bioluminescent microscopic life forms. They let off a blue light, and blue is the color of orgone energy, if you could see it. So when Wilhelm Reich used sterilized vacuum tubes and life appeared in there, he disproved that that theory that spontaneous generation is impossible. You know, that, that's what we were taught in science class, that people used to believe that could happen, but that's been shown that it can't. He showed that it could. So we're seeing something that is creating life that is beyond science's understanding. However, science can show that it happens. Yeah. 
the the nature of science is is actually very interesting if you think about it because the very word science comes from the Latin scientio which means to know but if you think about it, how many times have has science held to to some theory that is called a fact for many many years and then it comes to find that oh well, we were wrong about that. <laughs> let's let's change. We have to change everything now. That is, of course, when they actually admit that they have discovered something new, it contradicts what they thought they already knew. Yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? It's it's the word itself implies knowing, yet there really is no true knowing if you think about it. We we just we just have kind of a a nebulous idea of things, but but our our understanding is very limited, no matter what the topic is. It, it can can change at any moment. Yeah. And then one of the problems for uh, skeptical people acknowledging organomy is that it is somewhat subjective science because every organism is completely different from the next. And science needs everything to be very regimented and, and everything needs to be the same. And mechanistic science, which is what is pretty much being used all over the world now, it requires that everything be measured and that the same results be able to be produced over and over again. But mechanistic science doesn't work outside of a laboratory setting because each organism is completely different from the next, has a different level of consciousness, which affects its orgone energy field. And so because of this variability, it's very hard to measure and quantify organomic phenomena. So an organism like me that's very highly charged will handle disease differently than an organism that's contracted, where the orgone is contracted from a lifetime of stressful work. Uh, from unhealthy food, from societal problems like, you know, problems with parents, abuse, oppression, wars. There's so many things that contract the organism's natural OR, the orgone energy. That's the life force in us. So I would react completely differently to an external stimulus than they would, and likewise to a disease. So it's very hard to quantify something like this. That's why people have a lot of trouble with understanding organomy, because it is so subjective. Yeah. And you make a great point in the book that what it really takes to work with this type of energy is faith and that even scientific theories or experiments always begin with some like amount of faith that they will be able to prove this, that they will be able to make some sort of interesting discovery with their work. And I just thought that was a great, a great point. Mm -hmm. but, Otherwise, why bother experimenting, sure. quoting yeah. directly? <laughs> Well, I wanted to talk about too, like just the science of organite then, and I guess how all these orgone energy devices actually work. Because again, a lot of people who doubt that the energy exists, sure, but they also doubt the effectiveness of these devices that you guys create and then use to participate in this war on consciousness or not on the side of, you know, to, yeah, re yeah. to restore what is to being restore, destroyed sure. by the negative forces. Yeah. The yeah. whole second part of the book is what, what proves that so that 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 was yeah so so skeptics might say something like well you know how can how can metal shavings and resin and quartz crystals break up a cloud or a chemtrail or have any effect on the weather or the atmosphere at all how do you respond to that when a layman or a skeptic comes at you with those sorts of critiques well, well first of all the function of organite i should just go over how it works and we learned this from ken rolla and it was actually because of ken rolla being in the sciences and explaining it this way that we started doing it because previously we thought it sounded like nonsense, that the metal shavings, which we use a lot of them, very fine and a lot of them, packed into a polyester resin with quartz crystals and a copper coil, the resin, when it catalyzes around those metals and crystals, it amplifies their energetic qualities. They are already organ generators and they're like little antenna. They're programmed this way. And that's why they use quartz and metal in all of our technology. I mean, that's what's in cell phones to make them communicate. So we know that they are they are producing energy. The resin catalyzes around them, squeezes on them, and activates their piezoelectric properties and amplifies the already present orgone energy. Orgone is a spiraling wave that goes from Earth and into space. And I mean, it's it's infinite. You know, this is the energy of the universe. It's really everywhere. We generate it, mountains, plants, everything. Everything on Earth is generating this. So the basic function, it does sound a little bit strange. How could this work? But it is because of the squeezing action on the metals that is activating that. And in the environment, the way we proved that it works was from years and years. We've been doing this for almost eight years now. We put them near deadly radiation sources like cell towers, and it provides a counter 
field, a counter energy to the deadly radiation. And these energies are battling it out in nature constantly. In fact, the more you look at our work and you look at the pictures in my book and on the blog, you'll see, you could visually see the energies battling in the sky. So when we put the organites by the cell phone towers, it negates the deadly effects of it and it changes the energy. It's it's not like it gets rid of the deadly energy, but it just provides a counter frequency. And orgone energy, when it encounters deadly frequencies, actually works even harder. So you put it right by a cell tower, you get even more effect than just on its own. But it's really just through observing and taking pictures and recording weather changes for years and years, day after day after day, that we were able to see the same mm-hmm. results in every place. Yeah. Deserts, new, news uh, articles too, it, because yeah. like she said, about to say the same results, no matter what the terrain is, it could be deserts, mountains, coasts, valleys, any, anywhere will inevitably have the same results. It is invariably a, a reduction and lifting of pollution. And then depending on time of year and the climate of, of the place, rainfall or snowfall. And even on seasonal rainfall sometimes which we've had a lot of too throughout the years. So yeah, it's just about understanding what the sky is reflecting on earth. So when you look at the sky, you'll know, is the energy deadly and unhealthy or is it life affirming or somewhere in between or are the two battling it? By looking at it over and over again, by reading the clouds, we've learned to read the energetic signature of the earth. So I mentioned faith earlier. How much does that or a concept like intention matter when you're gifting? It it matters entirely. It matters completely because although the organite works no matter what, we too are orgone generators. And the real function of organite isn't just to put the device out there and let it work. It's also to help us restore our energetic field and be able to manifest life-affirming conditions. So we really do create the world through our thoughts. It's not like we're, we're God's creating out of nothing, but we take the energy of God, it works through us to manifest a beautiful world. So absolutely, it matters entirely that the Organite Gifter has a positive mind. And we also stress the importance of never, ever using a smartphone when you're gifting Organite or any cell phone or any DORizing device, any any device that emits that energy that we're fighting with Organite, because it reduces your consciousness level. It it squashes it. So yeah, you're the organites really to help us increase our consciousness so we can manifest. And the EMF emitters are designed to do the precise opposite, to suppress that within us. So how do I know when I look up into the sky when orgone energy is actually present, when DOR is actually present? I think I already know the answer to this, but just for people who might not, like when I actually go outside, like what can I observe in my own environment that would make me, you know, think that, okay, it's a nice positively charged day or it's a negatively charged day. Well, they're both actually they're yeah. both always present. Okay. Uh, it just, okay. just in varying degrees. You, it's meant, you mentioned a positively charged and negatively charged. This is the uh, difficult part. When it's a high OR day, it's actually negatively ionized. So it sounds it's like negatively opposite, charged. Right? Yes, I, I knew that. I, <laughs> and as then, as if that, we yeah. need more yeah. confusion. Right. But when it's so when it's deadly, it's positively ionized. So that's that's gonna be a little confusing. But let's uh, but Gabe, you have a good explanation. So you I didn't mean to cut you off. No, there. it's all right. I actually want you to explain. I just wanted to point out that both O R and D O R are natural and they're both in the atmosphere at any given time. It's just again, it's it's the amount of one versus the other. Okay. When there's too much DOR, then then it's it's out of balance. And Sharon will explain what you can expect to see in the sky yeah. when that's the case. But in a high DOR environment, you will see hazy skies, smog. Uh, you will not see defined clouds. Everything will look, the clouds will be flat. You'll see flat clouds. And as for chemtrails, I know that's a big indicator for people, but you have to understand what you're looking at when you see the jet trails in the sky. Now, we, we don't know what they actually are. We know that this isn't normal air flight. But when you see the crisscrossing trails, if they're spreading out and it looks really flat and um, it gets very depressing and, and it dims the light and everything, dims the sun, that is uh, an indicator of high DOR. However, just because there's chemtrails in the sky does not mean it's a DOR day. They react completely differently in OR conditions. So in OR, those same trails will be very short and very bright and even when you do see the grids forming, you'll see them puff up and they don't spread out. They puff up and they will dissipate. So that's one huge indicator. 
you'll also see in a high OR sky, you'll see like puffy cumulus clouds. Deep blue is another indicator. A DOR sky will be much paler. So look for, uh, for a healthy sky, look for deep blue, puffy clouds, or completely clear, very short, bright chemtrails or chemtrails that break and twist up. That's the kind of stuff that, those are the easy things to look for. The hard stuff to understand is the action of OR fighting DOR. So if you start with a DOR sky that's flat and hazy, to understand the process of transmutation, how the energy changes, that would take more time. My book explains it well. My blog entries explain it well. You can get all that through my website and learn it. I have a photo gallery that explains the different processes that happen in the sky. So when you see it clean up, look for spirals. If you see spiral shapes, that's an indicator of the spiraling orgone energy working to clean it up. You'll also see out of the haze, clouds start to form. They start to clump up. So that's how you know it's an in-between thing where it's working. So I think I was under the impression that DOR was completely man-made and not natural. Is that not true? Nope. Nope. Not true at all. Well, you know, uh, God created Satan too. (laughs) You know, God created everything. So we're talking about a creative force that created the whole universe and it couldn't exist. Good can't exist without evil in a dualistic world. I have a chapter in my book on dualism and that's what we're dealing with here is two forces. So DOR actually is natural. However, we are out of balance on Earth. We have too much DOR. It's, it's to the point where now, now things are changing. It's becoming more OR. But we were at the point where it was just so out of balance. We were dealing with terrible pollution worldwide, droughts everywhere. Although the news will continue to tell you there's drought everywhere, it simply isn't true. It's, we can prove it's not true through their own statistics. So anyway, it has changed a lot. And I, I also just want to point out that uh, if if my knowledge of organite and organomy were based solely on what the new age movement says about it, I wouldn't believe in it either. So the people that automatically just think that the whole thing is nonsense, I totally understand why you feel that way. We were in the same position in 2013 when we first learned about it. All we had to go on was was this mythical new age nonsense uh, about it. And uh, of course, the scientific mind is going to react poorly to that. We did. Yeah. But once we got Ken Rolla's explanation of it, a scientific explanation, a valid one, that's when things started to change for us. And then, then we thought, well, let's just, let's try it. Let's, what do we have to lose at this point? That was eight years ago, exactly eight years ago when we got started getting materials to make it. We made it for the first time in April of 2014. And that changed everything for us. Mm-hmm. And also reading Wilhelm Reich's work really helps. He didn't invent organite. But when you look at the devices that he did use and how they worked, you see that organite is the modern adaptation of it. And you can see from his work and everything that he cataloged, we're experiencing the same results with organite gifting that he did with the Cloudbuster. But in this case, more long lasting because the stuff is deployed into the environment and it's there now. Whereas when he was doing his work, it would be for a while in one spot, but then he'd have to move somewhere else and work elsewhere. So we have this wonderful energy grid now across the world. It is worldwide now. Many people are participating. And uh, I could say what we did was many states in the West, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. Those are the places we covered. But um, we've also sold to many people that have also gifted and we've taught people how to make their own and they've gifted. So it's getting, it's getting spread out all over the world. The skies reflect that. In fact, at the beginning of COVID, when they said, The skies are so clean in India. That's an example I'm giving because I mentioned the DOR skies in India. There was this amazing clear sky in India and it was pristine. And they said, oh, it's because no one's driving today because everyone has to stay home because of COVID. (laughs) Right. And I knew that this wasn't, this wasn't just from not driving. That's actually not really what causes the air pollution like that. I could see that it was just so high in OR that the sky was pristine. And that's what the parasites hate. That's why they do stuff like this, uh, the PSYOP, COVID PSYOP. It's a cover up for their computer virus. It's cover up for what we've done to disable That's them. That's Sharon's next book. But... I'm going to be writing about that in my next book. Wait, wait. So I've heard you say this term in some of your videos, computer virus 19 is how you guys kind of talk about it. And you don't have to spoil the whole book, but what do you mean by that phrase exactly? Well, um, in late 2019, a virus was introduced into the system. The entire world is run by artificial intelligence. These are the parasites we're talking about that we take down with orgone energy. They aren't life as we know it. 
but they are some sort of life. They're an artificial life. And they are actually what runs everything. And if you've noticed the push towards AI, it's more and more. I mean, the push towards cryptocurrency, that's artificial intelligence. Everything's in a computer. You can't escape mm -hmm. constant surveillance. And Every everything's got wireless, even things that don't need it. Trash cans, you know, you hover your hand over it, and the lid opens up. It, it's, it's to the point of absurdity. Right. So this whole world, though, all the governments, all the banks, it's all artificial intelligence. And in late 2019, it was specifically in September of 2019, a virus was introduced into their system. This has a lot to do with organite gifting. As Don Croft said, organite gifting will end world tyranny. He had said that. And it's absolutely true because the parasites cannot live in a high OR field. These are silicon-based artificial life. They are not like us. They actually need deadly radiation to live, which is why they've terraformed the earth this way. And by introducing this virus, it has something to do with organite gifting, but it also has something to do with the legal system and everything in that computer getting corrupted. There was some data that was put into that system at that time that corrupted everything. And this has only come out recently in the news, but in September of 2019, right when I said that CompVid started, now we're finding out there was a like a lethal banking glitch, something that just completely upended the banking system. And a lot of banks were in a lot of trouble at that time. Now, I know the banking, the government, all of this is all part of the AI. So something happened in that system at that time that was throwing everything off for them. And then they had to introduce COVID to us as a diversion from what had happened in their system. So they thought that since their thing wasn't working anymore and they were having these uh, these irreversible errors in their system, that by shutting down our businesses, that they could buy some time for themselves. And then yeah. they've also tricked us into thinking that the collapse of the economy is because of COVID, when in fact it was because of the computer virus. So I can't get too into it yet. I'm writing a book about it and we're still picking up the last pieces for this because these books take a long time because the saga continues. Yeah. And COVID is and was just a gigantic fear mining operation because the thing that the parasites can just, they can print up currency at will. That That's not, you know, the, the excuse that's given about, oh, uh, they just want to get richer and richer and richer. That's fiat currency is meaningless to the parasites. What they need is food. And the only way that they can feed is off of human suffering. That's why everything, everything, if anyone who's been paying attention in the last, just to say the last 20, 30 years, just to get a little time window, it's not just a coincidence that absolutely every single thing without exception has been geared toward making things as life negating and miserable as possible. That's not, that's not just happenstance. <laughs> I think that mm -hmm. that should be pretty obvious by now. It's it's going this way for a reason, and that is because they need food, and because of widespread organite gifting, they're running out of food. The sources that they used to have for years and years, you know, back in the '90s, life was was pretty easy. You you could just kind of this is more of something for you to talk about because you're a little <laughs> older than me, but but you could just kind of live your life, and and it wasn't it wasn't the the impossible task that it seems like it is now. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand. I completely agree with that. As somebody, I just turned 38 a couple months ago, so I probably all in the same range here. But yeah, growing up in the 90s was like, and granted, as a kid, everything's so innocent anyways, right? Like you just live life. You have no fear, no concerns about anything. And I, I just realized that like growing up in that era, and then when the when the internet is introduced into your home is what changed it for me personally. You know, just like I noticed in hindsight, a, a downward spiral from that point for me personally, right? Just in the way that interesting. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I wasn't like hooked on it or anything back then, because it was still dial up and slow as hell. And you just, you know, you, <laughs> you needed like the entire night to just log on to it, right? But I think that like, the way that I was interacting with it was, you know, it, it became the ubiquitous part of my life that it did for everybody else too. But the way that I handled it, I think was just, you know, it became an addiction almost like back in that time frame. And I don't know if that's what we're getting at here. If, if that was like some sort of parasitical infestation that I was dealing with, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I'm sure you guys have better takes on this than I do, but that's kind of where I was at with it back then was I felt like I was infested with something back then mm. as it was introduced into my environment. Well, you know, that makes sense. This stuff is designed to be addicting. And at the time, 
it wasn't wireless yet. So you were dial up and, you know, it wasn't just like putting out that signal into your house, but the content's addicting and it's designed to be addicting. But what they've done now is they've taken it to another level. So it's not just a, a mental addiction. It's not psychological anymore. It's a physical addiction now. With the advent of the smartphones and the increase of this radiation, people have actually become DOR addicts. Mm -hmm. And this is a serious problem because it's not recognized as an addiction. It's thought of as just a part of life. But I see a planet of drug addicts, and that's what's happening, and, and in different degrees for different people. But we're actually exploring uh, starting a rehab program for smartphone addicts because we're not just talking about a psychological addiction. It's like alcoholism. It's a physical addiction. It's, Your body worse, it's worse than alcohol addiction and heroin addiction combined. I know that that's that's a pretty well. It's more insidious. A pretty bold statement, but yeah, it, that that's exactly why. A heroin addiction and alcohol addiction. You could see the the symptoms outwardly, and that these are horrible, horrible things. But I think what gave society things, doesn't encourage them like it does with smartphones. Smartphone addiction is subtle, though. You're not going to have those overt symptoms, and you're not going to show it like that. But it's widely accepted. It's given to children. And we are developing a species of, it's a, of, of addicts, and it's a symbiosis with AI. So what's happened is that because of the energy, it's the EMF. It's not just the content. So like you're addicted because of the content. And that's Iowa's too. I understand that. We actually have an older video called Tech Addicts Anonymous that we put out a couple of years ago. And that was after our laptop died and we had to get it rebuilt and I had to go without it. I had to actually go on a trip without it. It was, I, I was having withdrawals from it, <laughs> but it's, we don't use it wireless. So it was just the content I was addicted to, but people who are hooked on smartphones and believe me, they are hooked. They can't stop reaching for it. If they turn it off, they keep turning it back on. It's a serious chemical it's like a chemical addiction but it's an energetic addiction well the difference also is that back you know maybe 25 years ago when i got my first computer when it was 95 you know it was very user friendly you would use the computer nowadays it's the other way around the technology is using people yeah and they've certainly dumbed it down a lot too to where anybody can use it even if you don't understand it i know tons of people who use their computers and phones and don't even know what they're doing and that's really a problem because we need to be controlling it and when you lose control of it it inevitably takes over your yeah, mind all of that star trek stuff about the ai just kind of self recognition and it, like it develops a mind of its own and then it just like goes on a rampage <laughs> it reminds me of of the tv in south park when chef hits the the hem the human eradication mode and then it just it goes on a <laughs> shooting rampage throughout yeah. the entire town it, it's it's i know that that's of course an, an extreme example and that's fiction but what what's going on in reality is is a subtler version of that but it's we can't we can't see it but like Sharon points out, you walk down the street and, and just everyone's everyone's glued to the thing. They they could walk right in front of a bus and get run over and wouldn't even know yeah, it. I do like that idea. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, here's an example is that we had a house guest that wouldn't even turn it off at night for sleep. He was okay with putting it in airplane mode, but not turning it off. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. People feel so dependent. I got an email from somebody who recognized the addiction and said that she couldn't stop reaching for it and realized that even after turning it off, she was trying to use it for stuff that she could have used other things for, like basic, like basic functions. So it really is the energy that's addicting. It's very insidious. For sure. And I can vibe with the idea of a content addiction because at any given moment, I have probably 150 podcast episodes downloaded on my phone and I don't even listen to them, but they're just there. It's like I'm just kind of like constantly downloading and downloading and downloading, but I don't even always listen to them. So, and I think this is also a good segue into something I wanted to touch on here in the first hour because there's an aspect of Reich's work that I've not heard discussed as much in these circles because it has to do more with psychoanalysis, which isn't as sexy to some people, but it's pretty sexy to me. And it's this idea of emotional armoring. And you mentioned armoring in your book several times. You also quoted Reich, who said, the first obstacle is not the outer desert, but the inner emotional desert of man. And Reich also found a correlation between pleasure and an expanded orgone state and anxiety with a contracted state. and he said that emotion was not or was completely tied 
to the biophysical state of the body and was in fact a combination of motion and energy, which is where we get the word, I think, emotion from, right? It's mo- the emotion right. emotion of energy. Emotion. Yeah. And yep. I'm, I'm curious from your experiences then, if you've done any, any psychological or psychiatric work in this area yourselves based on this idea, if you have any advice for us on how to you know, kind of help rid ourselves of that emotional armor. Wow. That's that's a great question. And by the way, thank you for doing your homework. Sounds like you read a lot of my book already. So I appreciate that. Um, I read the whole thing. Yeah. You did. Wow, you're a fast reader, but you, you also absorbed it, which is great. Well, the emotional armoring is caused by various things. Now we're talking about deadly radiation. That's the physical way they do it to us. So when I'm talking about that, that addiction to the phone, they physically um, armor us that way. And they lower our vibration because our bodies conform to that. So I would say, number one, you have to stop using the smartphone. I know that's easier said than done, but we uh, live a totally Wi-Fi free life. We don't have wireless internet in our house and we don't use smartphones or cell phones. We we have one cell phone we share. It's got three bucks on it a month in case we have to call AAA or something when we're out there in the world. But we don't turn it on otherwise. There's very little we do with it. So that's one thing. But another major problem in what Wilhelm Reich was talking about is even before smartphones, it's society that does this to us. The armoring is encouraged. The 40-hour work week, going to school, which is like a prison for children, pretty much. These are things that that society has encouraged emotional armoring. So breaking that cycle, is it's also easier said than done. But just knowing where it's coming from, I guess, would would help. It's parasitic in nature, but the whole human race has been infected with it. I think that Don Croft would call them parasitically infected. Mm-hmm. And Wilhelm Reich would say that they were armored. So it's basically the same thing. So yeah, he this, also this calls it emotional plague. That, emotional was, in the, that plague. was in the early days yeah. before he whooped his work, but that, that was that was an early term. But yeah, it's 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 a very tough question because we're talking about things that were passed down to us by our parents and their parents. The emotional armoring has to do a lot with conforming to the regimented society that we have now, and which is getting worse and worse, by the way. Conforming to something that's completely unnatural. It's unnatural. In every every sense. So in order to succeed in the corporate world, for example, you have to be armored. If you have feelings, if you're like me, I never succeeded in the corporate world. You know, you get eaten alive. So it does encourage that. I think that pretty much what you could do in your own life, and you could only do it for yourself. You can't force others into it, or try to get a group together. You've got to first get the deadly energy out of your life, make Organite, get that in your life and feel the difference. And you can start doing a meditation practice. You do need to find God. You do need to, whatever that means to you, you do need to find a higher power because until we submit to a higher power and give our life over to that, we will continue this cycle. So I think that, you know, it's, it's not an easy answer for you, but pretty much get rid of the deadly energy, bring in life-giving energy, understand there's a higher power and give your life over to it. It's actually a lot like overcoming any addiction. It's a lot like overcoming alcoholism. Yeah. And and we we say this over and over and over again, ad nauseum on our channel. You have to get rid of the EMF. You have to get rid of the phone and Wi-Fi. Those are the two big ones, but especially the phone, because that's like your personalized thing that you carry around. But that's but we what say, we're going to be we doing. We say it over and over again. And, 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 the people by and large are too addicted to even recognize that there's a problem. And that, that phone is, is the in for the parasites right. that that's like, that's their way of, of getting into you. And only by getting rid of it, it's like, br- like breaking the circuit. Like you pull out that mm-hmm. one little bit and the whole thing, it, it can't connect. Properly. Well, this is why we want to do a rehab program. So that would be the psychological work we got into. And it's going to take a while because uh, it's something nobody's ever done before. It's an addiction that's almost unrecognized on earth. So yeah, that's that's the plan is to develop a program. And I actually have a volunteer that came to me for help, which was the answer to my prayers because I've been wanting to do this. And somebody actually came to me for help with that. So I'm going to be working with this individual and starting to see, to see what works, you know, because this is an addict, an admitted addict that wants to recover and recognizes that a spiritual intervention is necessary. So We're going to try to develop that program and hopefully it grows and grows and we can start support groups for people as well. Yeah, sign me up. I mean, I'm not that bad. I've gotten off all social media. I still have the phone itself, you know, and I really only use it to talk to people, text people, which I don't like texting and listen to podcasts. That's that's like the only three uses I have, which I could do all of those in other venues. You know, I don't need a smartphone to do all that. 
Yep. Part of the part of the rehab program, if we were able to get a center for it one day and have people do retreats, would be to show people how very, very easy it is to stay connected and do all the things they've done before. Talk on the phone, email, do everything you need to do online, watch TV online. You could do all this stuff without EMF, without, I should say, RF, those because EMF is everywhere. There's different types of it. But I'm talking about the insidious type, that Wi-Fi signal and that cell phone signal. And we could show people a new life, you know, immerse them in this life and see that we have everything they have. We're not disconnected. We have a website, run an online business. We have a YouTube channel. We could stay in touch by our landline phone. We have everything everyone else has. And we don't use any of it. But when we ha- when we have to use a smartphone for longer than say 10 seconds, <laughs> we become complete. I, I, I'm not joking. We become completely disoriented. We, we, we literally just start like walking into things and we can't speak properly and can't think straight. It just, just, but that's just, that's because we haven't used, we haven't used Wi-Fi since 2014 and we haven't used cell phones except for the occasional emergency since 2016. Right. So that amount of time without, that's a long detox period. And when we reimmerse ourselves in that, even just going into the city most of the time, just just like I get a terrible headache when I go into LA. Well, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier when I was saying how it's hard to quantify it scientifically. Earlier when I was saying that uh, the highly charged organism is going to react differently than one that is used to a lot of DOR and contracted. If I have to use a smartphone for five minutes, I, I yeah, like Gabe said, I'm a mess. But other people use them all day, every day, and it doesn't seem to affect them. They're used to it. Their bodies have conformed to it. So we all act, react differently to orgone energy and deadly radiation. But at the same time, you see just how impossible it is to get even the simplest thing done these days. So <laughs> it, it, it may, on the surface, appear to not really be affecting them. On a deeper level, it absolutely it is and has. Yeah. And I want to. I don't want to change the subject because I want to keep going on this, but I do want to squeeze a couple other things here in the first hour. Yeah, that go I for to it. Touch on, and I want to go back to the idea of chemtrails because you also say that the difference between your research and the doctrine of anti geoengineering activist groups is that your work has also shown that when it comes to chemtrails, that they are not necessarily chemical trails, but perhaps something else entirely. Yeah, And there is some credence to that because when we dig into the work of Reich, which you do in the book, obviously, you find that his research shows that deserts were artificially created and that the cause was kind of around well before humans had the technology to manipulate the weather. And if there was an outside influence on our weather from elsewhere, that the U.S. government did not want that information getting out. And so, you know, there's a lot to unpack here, but let's unpack that some more. What do you think was responsible for creating these desert areas? And what are these trails if they're not chemical? Well, when Wilhelm Reich figured that out, that was from doing his uh, cloud busting operations in Arizona in the desert. And the DOR had been around long, long before chemtrails. I mean, as we know them, we really don't know what the skies looked like back then. I mean, you could look at old movies and you could see chemtrails. So I could tell you they've been around a long time. I mean, I'm talking about movies even back to like the 40s. I see. I see chemtrails, well, but unless they went back and put them in, is, I have thought a, about I've, that. I've seen that theory that they went back and like put. Them I have in, thought about that. I don't know if that's true, or not. but I don't think Plausible, that's the case. Plausible but false. Because yeah. Wilhelm Reich actually documented jet trails in his work, so we know that trails from planes have been around since there's been planes in the sky. But weather modification by humans was invented in the 40s, and that was through cloud seeding. And there wasn't flight much before that. I mean, think about. The, the history of flight. So once we got up there, some people thought, well, we can introduce silver iodide into the clouds and make them rain out more. That was the beginning of weather modification by people. But what we're seeing here is on a very, very large scale. And Wilhelm Reich found that the weather was being modified long before chemtrails as we know them. I mean, in his day, the jet trails were quite different than the jet trails of today. So this is a kind of a complicated topic, but the jet trails Wilhelm Reich observed behaved differently than the ones today. When there was high orgone energy, the jet trails of the 50s would actually stick across the sky. And today when there's high orgone energy, the trails don't stick. So we're looking at different kinds of trails, obviously. So yeah, I'm not saying that they're not doing something up there or that it's just normal flight. The reason in Wilhelm Reich's day 
that the trails stuck when there was high orgone energy is because they were water vapor trails. He was actually observing true, water true contrails. Trails. Conversely, when there was an, a DOR imbalance and DOR was prevailing over OR, the trails would not stick, whereas today they do. So it's the opposite it, today. Yeah. So we're seeing something that today, when it's high orgone, they don't stick. When it's high and deadly energy, they do stick, obviously, to different kind of trails. So we acknowledge that these aren't contrails. But what they are, we don't know. The government has a lot of people out there telling you that they are made of heavy metals. And, and by the way, all the anti-geoengineering stuff, it's all from the government. So it's not some, it's not really the other side of things. It's the same side. We're getting it from government employees. They're saying it's heavy metals and that it's being used to change the climate. But in, in reality, we don't know. We have no proof of what it is up there. We have a lot of evidence that it is not human in origin, that these planes don't make any sound. And, it, and you'll, now that I've said it, you can check out the sky any day, watch them fly. You won't hear anything. The ones you do hear, you don't see. That's the weird part. We only hear them every once in a while, but or mostly the, they're flying up there and you don't hear them. Or the sound is coming from somewhere completely different than where the image of the plane appears right. in the sky. So we're seeing all of this traffic up there with no sound and we're seeing anomalies like when you zoom in on the planes, you could see holographic anomalies. Perhaps these are projections to mask something else. What I think is happening, and this is theory, so I have not been able to prove this, but I will say what I think is happening is that there's some kind of interdimensional flight going on in the atmosphere that depends on deadly radiation in order to do it. I think that most of what we see up there is not air flight as we know it, but something that depends on DOR conditions. And I think it's it's completely linked in with the cell tower grids. As you can see, they fly in grids. The cell towers are in grids. That's a deadly radiation grid that when it's active, they're flying in grids up there. And when it's deactivated or neutralized, you don't see them as much. Yeah. Indeed. Not only do the trails break up, but many days you won't see any planes at all if the orgone energy is too high. And may, there were many news articles out in the second half of 2021 talking about tons of canceled flights, yeah. mysteriously just all across the board, just a whole bunch of flights canceled. And the other thing I noticed starting around 2021 was for years and years, we never heard anything up there. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this. If you live near an airport, you'll hear stuff, but we don't. You don't hear them. All of a sudden in 2021, I started hearing more planes. Why did we suddenly start hearing them? It might be the same reason that they say on a cloudy day, you hear them more than on a sunny day. High OR makes clouds. Perhaps they can't fly the interdimensional ones that rely on DOR during these conditions. And maybe there's so much organite in the environment now that they've gone back to relying on traditional air travel. I know that sounds very wild, but I don't think that most of what's up there is humans, human activity. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about as a follow-up here, because you throw out the term interdimensional travel or interdimensional flight or something, and you're... <laughs> You're implying that there are other dimensions, okay, that we can also access, I would imagine. What are these entities then? I mean, we're seeing uh, craft, like, I guess, would you call these UFOs in the sky? I they would look like regular planes or drones, but like, would you call them UFOs? They do look like planes. Um, for years, I've been zooming in on them and taking pictures of them, and I've been noticing anomalies. So in my book, you could see some of those things. Like, for example, here's here's a really telling one. I think the planes might actually be holograms to mask something else, because I have pictures of a plane with two engines and two trails coming out of it. But then there's a mysterious third trail, a thinner one, in the middle, and there's no engine for it. So the thought there was, and I've had this more than once, and you can see it in my book, perhaps there was something behind the plane that we see that was flying with one trail because it wasn't coming out of either of the plane's engines. We had another one where it was completely missing the middle of the plane. I zoomed right in on it, and it was a low flyer with a trail, and it was just missing part of it. It almost looked like the sky was a green screen, or a, let's say a blue screen, and the plane, the color matched too much, so part of it just disappeared. So we've seen things that show yeah. that it possibly is a projection. And there's a third one still where, where the trail is appears to be coming out of the entire mm. length of the wingspan evenly. It's just yeah. all, the, all the way from one side of the plane to the other where the wingspan is just strung out behind it. That's in my book too. And that trail that he's talking about, 
it's not coming out of the engines of the plane. It's like you said, the whole wingspan, but it breaks up and it doesn't break up in even pieces. Pieces of it break here and there. It's very strange. They're reacting very strangely to atmospheric conditions. I also have another picture in my book of a chemtrail spiral where every plane, it was in Eastern Oregon while we were gifting, every plane was like going to the West and careening into this spiraling energy. All the clouds were spiraling and every plane was curving into it. Like, it was wa almost like, like they, water down a drain. It was almost like they couldn't control it. And we regularly see curving chemtrails on high OR days. That would indicate a spiraling vortex throwing them off track. I see many indicators in the sky that the planes are holographic. The pictures in my in my book show it. So, you know, you can take that you can take that for what whatever it is, you know, just look at it and see what do you think when you see it. But there's a holographic elements to it and the trails react very strangely when there's high OR and suddenly in 2021 we're starting to hear planes again. Now, human planes make a sound. I know that cuz you hear them take off at the airport, they make a loud sound. These ones I'm talking about they don't act like anything that we've ever flown on. Yeah, they're supposed to make a sound. I remember being a kid in the 90s on the playground at school and a plane would fly over it and I'd have to yell at the kid next to me just so he could hear me. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're incredibly loud. But if the planes are holographic, then how can they spray something out? Because to me, a hologram is something that it's not physical, right? It's not material. It's like it's almost like a mirage, like an illusion, you know? So what's coming out the back end of this hologram then? Is that also a mirage? Because it stays in the sky for hours. I don't think it's a mirage. I think the trails are real. I think the hologram might be masking whatever is making the trails. Hmm. Okay. That's what I think. But I'm not saying that this is proven. All I'm saying is I have a lot of, a lot of pictures that show very, very strange things that can't be explained uh, by any conventional means. And whether the trails linger or vanish fairly quickly, all again, all depends on the OR or DOR state yeah. of the atmosphere. Yeah. All that's proven here is that they react differently in different energetic conditions. That's all that's proven beyond that. Who's doing it and why? We can only guess, but I, I think that this has everything to do with the parasites and it has everything to do with that cell tower grid because they seem to work in grids, if you've noticed. They fly in grids. They've gridded the land. It's an energy grid. They've terraformed the earth to their energy field. And here we are messing it up for them by neutralizing it. And I, I think that does have something to do with the flight cancellations. They say weather conditions, but we have day after day after day here with no planes. I'll see one day with tons of them, then not, a day with no none trails, of them. no trails, no planes. No planes. So something weird is going on. I've seen that too, actually, here. I live in, in Southwest Ohio. I'm about 35 minutes from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So that's a major hub of activity here. And there are days where like all of a sudden it'll be clear and sunny in the morning. And then a couple hours later, it's just blanketed. But I never saw anything in the sky. It's like mm -hmm. the clouds or the trails just came out of nowhere. And I guess I didn't really think about it. I just, I just assumed that like, well, of course, I'm not outside all day watching the sky. I'd like to be, but I'm not. But uh, I noticed that like when I do see trails forming sometimes, especially earlier in the morning, I don't always see aircraft with them. And I, I can never really put together why that would be. So Well, in that too, you might actually be seeing um, DORized clouds. I mean, they might, if they're trail shaped, then they're trails. But if they're just kind of flat clouds that we associate as chemtrail clouds, that could just be the atmospheric conditions mm -hmm. reacting on water vapor. Because a lot of the chemtrail stuff we see up there is actually DORized water vapor, meaning it's positively ionized. The clouds can't form properly. And that's why it looks all hazy. Yeah. Flat, two-dimensional. But if you're of. seeing trails like that too, yeah. yeah, it's coming out of something. But I would recommend just checking on the sky like every half hour, every hour, if you can just watch it and see what happens. Because it's only through observation that we can really see what's mm -hmm. going on up there. And I think that everyone's seeing the same type of things. Uh, Ohio is not too bad off. There's a bunch of organite there now. And actually, a couple of people have gifted our organite there, which is cool. And I know that there was another guy that was years ago, I was reading about or watching videos of somebody working there. I don't know if he was a gifter, but I know that there's organite around Ohio. So you guys shouldn't be in too bad a shape. Um, somebody, one of our um, customers who bought Tower Busters from us in Cleveland, uh, showed it was in Cleveland, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. he showed a, a picture of their sky. 
And he was upset about the chemtrails. But when you look at them, they actually those are neutralized chemtrails. You can see them breaking up. You can see they're not spreading out. So the conditions you guys are having is not as bad as it used to be. Well, yeah. And I, I did some gifting too. You could probably guess where. And it was tremendous results just right away. You know, like within the first 10 minutes, you could tell that there was some positive OR going on there. So what, you know, what happened Don, when oh, you... Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask you what happened. Uh, what did you see in the sky? Well, actually, the first thing I noticed wasn't even in the sky. It, well, I guess you could say it was, but it was the wind. It was the wind just picked up within like five or 10 minutes of putting these... I was using some earth pipes and some tower busters. And um, within 10 minutes, like that wind had picked up and there was uh, just a large collection of birds that came and circled over top of where I was. And I thought that was super interesting too. I did this twice. The second time was more noticeable because there was actually more cloud cover when I did it. The first time I did it was actually pretty clear. Uh, But the second time within, I'm going to say 30 to 60 minutes, the area that we gifted, the clouds were completely gone. That's awesome. In a matter of like 30 to 60 minutes. But you could see like the, the whole sky was blanketed like over this spot. And just the direct spot where we had gifted these earth pipes going straight up and then out a little bit, there was completely clear skies, but you could see the rest of the sky was still blanketed. Right. That's like we had just made a like a hole in that specific area. That's awesome. So, and that's how we first, uh, the first time we ever made Organite, it did that. And then we, we could see that the same thing you saw. And yeah, the wind picking up that stagnant energy gets, gets changed. It gets transmuted. All of a sudden you've got this this rush of orgone energy, it brings in the wind, the birds, that's totally an indicator. That's, that's really great. And one thing you'll see is if you gift a tower, you might see birds sitting on it. You'll never see birds sitting on a cell tower unless it's been gifted. And it's just such a beautiful thing to go back to somewhere you've gifted and see a bird on the tower and know, ah, the organite's still there. So yeah, you, you did it. Your results are, are exactly what's supposed to happen. OR overtaking DOR. It's, it's good overtaking evil. Yeah. Well, I used to think like, I used to see a lot of birds sitting on towers and I was like, these birds are fucking stupid. Like, why are they sitting on these towers? And, <laughs> but then, but now I get it because of what you just said. I'm like, oh, like I get that, that tower must have been gifted by somebody. Like, great. Because I drive by a specific spot where there's just like, there's a, just a mess of towers. And on a couple specific ones, I always see like hundreds of birds sitting on them. And I'm just like, because they can, I don't think those birds are stupid anymore. You know, there's something going on there. So. <laughs> Um, Very while we're, cool. I want to close the first hour here by talking about some of the results that you guys have seen over the years, because you've done way more gifting than I have, obviously. And you've recorded plenty of observations from your direct involvement in balancing the weather and the climate over all these years. What are some of the more compelling pieces of evidence that you've gathered that validate the existence of orgone and the effectiveness of organite? Well, the, the big one at the beginning was in... 2017, it was in April of 2017, finally, the California drought was declared over. And this was following some massive gifting efforts. We went up to the Pacific Northwest and we gifted on the Oregon coast and in Portland, Oregon, because we saw that the winter weather that comes down from the Northwest was being blocked. And so we went up there. We'd already done a ton in California at that point. We went up there and did a huge job and tore down the West Coast frequency fence and it literally within within a month the drought was over and it was declared officially over on April 7th of 2017. Well the drought ac- actually ended the winter of 2014-2015. They were just able to like just like they do now hang on to the propaganda for as long as they can, but it just got she was saying it got to be so saturated with moisture all of California was at, at that point that they had no choice but yeah. to declare it over officially. The Central Valley was like an emerald. The Central Valley is not really a picturesque part of California. It was absolutely stunning after this major energy shift. So they did officially declare the drought over. Yes, it had been ending for a long, long time. But even up in Oregon, they were getting suddenly getting snow. It also brings a lot colder temperatures. They were getting snow in Portland. And so that was a huge one was ending that drought. And then we did yet even more. We The year of 2018, we did a tremendous amount of work. We went back up to the Northwest. Well, first we did uh, San Diego. No, actually even more than that. We In the beginning of the year in January, we did Ventura County to heal the fire damaged areas. We completely gridded without missing a tower, Ventura Camarillo, 
and and Oxnard. and Oxnard. I mean, street by street by street, we did everything, and that helped a lot. That brought a lot more rain. They had record breaking rain in Santa Barbara right after that uh, torrential rains. Then we went up to we went down to San Diego and we did that because I was noticing that we were not getting everything we should from the in the south. Like I thought they should have more rain. So we did San Diego completely. I mean, we did the whole city. Then we went up to Seattle. We did Seattle, Washington coast, and we also did more in Eastern Oregon. And then after that, we went through Arizona and New Mexico, and we just did a little bit there because we, that's all we could do. We just did the freeway. And then we did Santa Fe where we were. Then we we saw that we would need to go back for more later. But after doing all that in 2018, uh, the winter of 2018 to 2019 was the highest precipitation on record for the entire continent. So these are the big things that we're seeing is we have to keep track of record-breaking rain. And this is phenomenal results. But those are the two big ones, I would say. Yeah. I mean, there's there's even more. I mean, in more recent uh, excursions. And then to watch the media stumble over themselves <laughs> to try and downplay the precipitation and just say, but it won't put a dent in the day. I don't know if they were doing it back then, but but they'll they'll use any opportunity they have to again this goes back to what i was saying at the very beginning where everything consistently is done to be as life negating and negative as possible well that's part of it if there's big rains they'll just downplay it if it's too big to downplay it then they'll talk about uh, the flooding or the, the fire damage and the burn skin. A- any possible way that they can spin it in a negative fashion they will take full advantage and a couple other really notable results were in 2021 our giftings Project Monsoon and Project Newsom. Project Monsoon was a full grid of Phoenix, Arizona. We did in that city, that was too big to do every single tower, but we did uh, cover the whole city street by street and make sure to have like, we have like an act, uh, I could say like a cross down the middle and then all around the perimeters, freeway giftings. Um, they had the most rain ever on record July of uh, 2021 in Tucson, like record breaking rain all over Arizona. And after Project Newsom, which was Sacramento, we had unbelievable record-breaking rain a week later in Sacramento and in the Bay Area, like 12 inches at Mount Tamalpais, 5.44 inches in one storm in Sacramento. So these are the kind of results we're looking at. You guys are literally doing God's work there. I mean, I don't. There's no. There's no better way to describe it. I think so. We're going to switch over to the second hour now for patrons only. Before we do that, let's remind the free audience where they can keep up with you and your work. Our website is thekembo.com. That's T-H-E-C-H-E-M-B-O-W, thekembo.com. And we put everything there and links to our uh, blog with our weather reports and all the work we've done, our YouTube channel, um, our shop, if you want to support us. We very much appreciate it. So um, That's how we are able to keep gifted. Yeah. We've gifted 7,000, this Plus. is a, <laughs> approximate yeah. 7,000 pieces of organite since the spring of 2014 and we would like to gift a lot more yeah there's, we've got some big projects coming there's up there's a bit some stuff in the works and we would like to continue to do that and people's support is all that we have we wouldn't be able to do this without yeah. the donations that people give and just buying organite and buying organite helps you too yeah then and, you can gift them and even the decorative pieces you keep in your home and that that really helps with people's sleep and and just just general mood it helps everything thank you so much for talking to us today yeah, about thank all you. This. and there you have it my thanks again to sharon dothna and gabriel lazar please do check out their website and their youtube channel both are linked in the show notes sharon's book which you can get through the website is well worth the read it is a time commitment about 400 or 500 pages if i remember correctly but it'd make a pretty nice gift to red pill some of your normie friends it's a comprehensive look at how the system operates and a rather sobering overview of this war on consciousness. I regret not following up more on the whole AI virus subject and some of the things they said about it, particularly that part about the banks being, gosh, what was it, under attack and COVID being a cover-up for that. Is that true? Do you guys know anything about this? Because I sure don't. But this idea that the entire world is run by AI, that's not far-fetched. It actually might explain this phenomenon we call synchronicity. I mean, if you can get served up targeted ads on social media for things you've only thought about in your head, there's no reason something like that can't also happen elsewhere on a much larger scale. Maybe that's just the universal AI algorithm fucking with you. And I've had too many weird experiences, too much weird shit happen to me in my life for me not to consider this at least. Also, remind me to tell you guys sometime about my precognitive COVID download that I was actually turning into a fictional story years before COVID actually became a thing. That's rather terrifying. 
beyond that, I can never get enough Wilhelm Reich in my life. I've come to really admire the man and his work recently. It really is quite literally a never-ending rabbit hole of esoteric goodness. And Sharon calling orgonomy the science of God really struck me, because Reich himself doesn't distinguish between orgone and God. He says they're the same principle. I've also come around to that same belief as well. I did think we spent a little too much time on the smartphone stuff, which wasn't part of my notes, but it does seem like something Sharon and Gabe are passionate about, and it does connect to Reich's work and his idea of deadly organ radiation. I would have liked to talk more about emotional armor, or character armor, as Reich called it, as well as this idea of the emotional plague, but those are probably topics best discussed on their own at length another time, because they are relatively under-discussed topics in this particular genre of podcasts. Actually, I can't say I've ever heard these topics discussed. And they're highly applicable to both the individual and collective health and wellness and the consciousness right now. And what about the rather provocative conversation towards the end there around what's actually flying around up there in the sky? Holographic planes, interdimensional aircraft powered by DOR? Wow. But a lot of the planes, at least in my perspective, in my experience that we're talking about, they absolutely make no noise whatsoever. But I also can't dismiss the idea that these are just normal, boring government airplanes because... I remember seeing a TV commercial several years ago, I think it was from Lockheed Martin, and they were advertising stealth aircraft using invisibility cloaking technology. So if they can do that, I'm quite sure they can cloak the sound of a craft as well. But also, if they can do both, sound and visual, why aren't we looking up and just seeing random trails spreading across the sky without any noticeable craft spraying them? Or maybe that's what's happening too. I don't know. I think the bottom line here is, wherever we are, whatever this place is, whatever the fuck is going on here... It's a lot stranger, a lot more unusual than any of us realize. And this is coming from someone who has a pretty nice list of paranormal experiences, a synchromistic mindset of his own, and a rather active and vivid imagination. And I did want to touch on where I've been the last few weeks, just briefly. Let's call it a spring break, but I did have to buckle down and do some writing for a soft deadline for a screenwriting project. And there's another harder deadline coming up for the rewrite, not until the end of April, beginning of May. But I am going to need to take some more time to focus on that, which means April might be a little bit slow as well. I do have two interviews scheduled in the next 10 days or so, which means there will be content recorded and hopefully uploaded a lot sooner than this one was, because I don't think, or at least I hope, that this rewrite isn't as intense as the last three weeks have been for me. So just wanted to throw that out there for you patrons who do spend your money here. I hope you understand, and even if you don't, and you're unhappy with this, I get that too. However, there was a full second hour with Sharon and Gabe, where we discussed a lot of legal and lawful matters, including religion, Ligio, and the rebinding. Natural law versus God's law, last names and surnames, the assumed name certificate and how that works, and that took up a large bulk of the second hour, Uh, understanding business as creative and spiritual people, property and the final battle over it, the jubilee year, and how to identify controlled opposition, mostly in the geoengineering space, but I think there might be some things in there where you could apply it across the board. So you can hear that on Patreon or Substack for 7 bucks a month. Patreon is honestly a better bet for you if you're curious because you also get the old old culture patron extensions if you're interested in those. Uh, Those started around episode 60, I think. So a much better value than the Substack, which is just the stuff I've been doing since last October. I think it's worth it, but you're ultimately the judge of that. Regardless, thank you for the time, thank you for the support, and as you might imagine, I have a lot to catch up on, so ramblers, let's get rambling. Until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority.
please rewind this cassette.